This is Dr. Kenneth Matthews and his teaching on the book of Genesis. This is session number 13, The Covenant Ceremony and the Covenant Sign, Part 2, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through chapter 17, verse 27. Today is Lesson 12, Part 2, continuation of our discussion of what we find in chapters 15, 16, and 17. Last time we spoke of the covenant ceremony in chapter 15, and now we want to conclude this important section in chapter 16 with the birth of Ishmael, and then in chapter 17, the covenant sign. When it comes to Hagar and Ishmael in chapter 16, we find that it has been 10 years since Abraham and Sarah entered into um, Canaan. Chapter 16, verse 1 describes Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. So this is bringing forward what we had learned in chapter 11, that she was barren and she continued to be so. In uh, uh, verse uh, that uh, follows, it says, Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Sarah, or rather Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years. So you can see now that uh, Sarah is 75 years of age and uh, Abram is 85 years of age. So uh, they, they choose in a, a desperate move to um, a, offer a, 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 a different plan whereby a, a child would be born. And so you will remember that in chapter 15, where there was the proposal of adoption of, a, of um, Eliezer, a servant in the household of Abraham, that God responded by saying in chapter 15, verse 4, a son will come from your own body who will be your heir. Well, that uh, it, what we find with Hagar and Ishmael is a a proposal for having a child by Sarah herself meets that expectation because Abraham will be the father. Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant, will be uh, the mother and then will uh, be considered the offspring of Abraham, Sarah. So uh, when it comes to the custom of adoption by a surrogate mother. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, must have been acceptable and something that was uh, uh, an option by uh, Sarah and Abraham because Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So he, he, he slept with her, we are told, he, in verse 4, he slept with Hagar and uh, she conceived. Now, if you look at the previous verse, notice what it says using the language of Genesis 3 on the part of Eve, who took the fruit and then gave it to her husband. This is what is recounted in Genesis 3. So this is what is said in verse 3 of chapter 16. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. This may be an intentional reflex of what occurred in the garden. And so the human condition continues in 
a uh, troublesome doubting of God's Word, part of the spiritual journey, part of growing in your relationship with God is when we do stumble, that God does not abandon, but rather He rescues. And we will find that in this case, that there is another step taken by God to rescue the plan. There's a threat to the promise here because Hagar is a foreigner, an Egyptian. So echoes of uh, Eve's sin then will set us on alert that the procreation promise is going to be realized and God is going to see to it. So what occurred as a consequence was a rivalry between the two women, Sarah and also Abram, uh, Hagar. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. So you can see that the very strong tradition of a woman's identity in antiquity was having children. And if you did not have children, then you were looked down upon by um, society. And so there was always prestige associated with women who had multiple children. And then, of course, a, uh, a diminishing of the value of a woman if she did not have children. This, of course, was a, a custom and not a biblical demand, not a biblical precedent. And so we do know, of course, that uh, there are women who don't have children, uh, either by choice or perhaps by uh, in the inability, either by husband or the woman herself to uh, conceive and have uh, a child. But that is not to be understood as something to be uh, despised nor is it to be understood that this is God's punishment. That is uh, something that it was a, a custom in antiquity during these early uh, years of Israel's experience and it is not to be applied universally to uh, Christian women today. So, the fact that she despises Sarah, see, is reminiscent of the promises, whoever blesses you will be blessed. But here we have a curse that is taking place. I'm using that word to describe what is taking place with Hagar's attitude toward Sarah. That word curse is not in the text, but it is reminiscent of what we find in the promise. Then uh, we find that Sarah responds with uh, um, really a charge against Abraham. It's a rather shifting of blame where she says, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And so there is a sense, I think now, of uh, suffering from the decision that she has made. And uh, she... Uh, recognizes, or at least charges, Abraham with being a co-participant. May the Lord judge, and she rightly gives it to the Lord to determine who is at fault. And I think we can say confidently that both are to be understood. 
as at fault. Verse 6, Your servant is in your hands. And so Abram said, Do with her whatever you think best. This must have been of um, a great uh, sadness on the part of Abraham because after all, Hagar is carrying um, his child. So uh, since that Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Now we have uh, again an evidence of God's great mercy as in verse 7 we learn that the angel of the Lord, this messenger of the Lord, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. And uh, he said, Hagar, where have you come from and where are you going? And she says, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Verse 9, Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will so increase your numbers that they will be too numerous to count. We have certainly heard this before. Promises made to Abraham. Numerous offspring like the dust of the earth and the stars of the sky. And now we have the promise extended by the Lord based on the relationship that this child will have with Abraham. God so blesses and enriches the life of Abraham. And even this one, Ishmael, who was not uh, in uh, conformity to God's perfect will, is nonetheless blessed with great progeny, and he will become the father of 12 nations. And this uh, genealogy of Ishmael will come in later chapters. Now the angel Lord does describe uh, this character of Ishmael. And this is found in verse 11. The angel Lord said, to Hagar. You are now with child, you have a son, and you shall name him Ishmael. Now this is striking because the name Ishmael means God, that's the E-L. Ishmael, God hears. Ishma, God hears. So that's the explanation for the Lord has heard of your misery. And so God is merciful, attentive to the needs of the Egyptian slave woman, and that He will protect and provide for her and her child. And that is, it says that um, the Lord here is going to provide great progeny for um, Ishmael. And in verse 12, it says, this is his character. He will be a wild donkey of a man. In other words, he will be living on the margins of society in uh, the arena of uh, the wilderness. He will also be a very hostile figure. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. And that is what takes place, just as we saw the hostility between Sarah and Hagar. This will be passed on to their descendants. And there will be rivalry between the offspring of Ishmael and the promised offspring of Isaac. Uh, 
And uh, we will see this throughout the long history of uh, the nations that emerged from Ishmael and then Israel. Now, um, there is a, another play on the experience of um, Hagar because uh, we have here language that has to do with seeing. And if you look at verse 13, you are the God, she says, she gave the name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. Now, uh, El Roy, E-L, God, is the one who sees me. That's the word Roy. Some versions will have actually the name El Roy. Here in the New International Version, it is translated, and it is translated uh, uh, the God who sees me. So uh, that is why she named the spring or the natural well Bier Lahoy Roy, which means the well of the living one who sees me. And so this became an important way of uh, identifying the location with her experience. And it is a tribute to God, as she can best understand it, as an Egyptian woman, using that um, generic term for God, El. But um, what God has uh, chosen to do is to extend His mercy and kindness, even to what we might call the outsiders. And we'll see this again in the life of Esau and the Edomites, that uh, God has a plan of mercy for all the nations, a blessing for all the nations, even the traditional enemies of Israel, as we saw in the table of nations. Verse 15, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael, so upon returning, there must have been an explanation Hagar gave to Abraham. And he complies by naming the son Ishmael. Then we have a, a date here on the age of Abraham. So this is very helpful to us in uh, the chronology and measuring this journey on the part of Abraham. And we will find that Ishmael is 13 years older than Isaac. Let's uh, continue then with the covenant of circumcision, which is found in chapter 17. And this is an important chapter for us because it has to do with one of the chief identifying markers of Abraham's offspring in Israel and that is the covenant sign of circumcision. If chapter 15 pertains to the ratification by ceremony, then chapter 17 is the confirmation by sign of circumcision. There are some scholars who believe that it's a different covenant it's identified as the covenant of circumcision because uh, you have the explicit stipulation in verse uh, 1 that reads, The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, and then here would be, Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. But I think that there is a parallel between chapters 15 and 17 that indicate, at least in my mind, and those of other commentators, that this is a continuation of the same covenant. 
because in uh, chapter 15, verses 1 and 7, you have the I am statement. And then in chapter 17 here, we have the I am statement, I am God Almighty. So here we have the Hebrew El Shaddai, God Almighty. What we want to see in chapter 17, and I hope to bring this repeatedly to our attention as we are tracing and applying the spiritual journey of Abram is that there is a developing closer relationship between God and Abraham. This is the part of the way in which God is training and teaching Abraham about himself, that is the Lord, and then also about Abram himself and the, the nature of the promises, the certainty of the promises and how God is going to use these promises in an unfolding way of providing for a deliverer. So we need to keep that in mind. A closer relationship is evolving. Also, we want to see in this chapter, and we've seen this before, but I bring it to your attention now, that God wants to make himself known you could say God wants to make himself seen and heard. This comes out of the abundance of God's love. We've spoken of this, how he chose to create because of the overflow of his love, his desire to create a special people. He calls this special people his own possession how he wants to share his life, all of the marvelous awesomeness of God, life, life everlasting, perfect love, perfect joy, perfect peace, all these wonderful aspects of God's life. He wants to share that with a people who want to receive it, and who do receive it by faith and trust in God's revelatory word. But God makes himself known in a number of ways of revelation. We've seen uh, a direct speech. Then we've seen um, visions take place. And so when it comes to chapter 17, we see another appearance on the part of the Lord making himself known and making himself heard. And we may recognize as Christians that so devoted and committed in, uh, is the Lord God to creating for himself and rescuing a special people for himself that he has chosen to come himself in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. As uh, the letter to the Colossians indicates, the fullness of all of the God head, all of God is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so God has chosen to come himself in the second person of the triune God, the Son of God, and he has come himself not as a rescuing angel, such as we have seen here in chapter 16. And he has come as a baby, a child, a promised child, who grew up as humans do. And he was fully human and fully God. What a unique mystery is the identity and the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is that this is such a closer relationship by virtue of our Lord's humanity experiencing what we experience so much and yet 
He remained perfectly faithful to the Lord. He voluntarily took on the sufferings and woes of life and death for all of us, absorbing the pain and the losses and yet overcoming our arch enemies of the devil, Satan, and of uh, uh, disease and death and coming to new life and making that possible for us. If we receive the offer of entering into the kingdom of God by faith, entering into the life of God, so he appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. We don't know exactly how to understand Shaddai. There have been some suggestions. The translations in English typically follow the Greek rendering, God Almighty. But this is the L, one of the L names, just as we saw with L. L. Young, and as we saw with L. Roy and uh, others, this is one of the L names that were um, often spoken by the patriarchs in identifying the Lord God. Now, the uh, language walk before me and be blameless will remind us then of Enoch in the Sethite genealogy who walked with God and then was translated into the presence of the Lord in heaven. And then also Noah, who is said to be a godly man walking before the Lord. We remember in the uh, Job story, he's identified as blameless. So this is a call then for Abraham to walk closer with the Lord and he has to do so by devoting himself to right uh, faith in the Lord and right behavior. Now this language, blameless, doesn't mean that he is perfect. Rather, what is uh, a term that's used for completeness or wholeness. Be a person is the exhortation. In my covenant to have a life of integrity, have a life of faithfulness and godliness. So I do not think that what we have in mind here is that he's earning covenant or he's earning righteousness, for after all, this has been declared the case. But rather what he's saying to him and what I think we can take away from this passage is that we, by God's enabling grace, make effort to have a life that is devoted in faith, in trusting ourselves and all that we have, and all that we are to God's good keeping, believing in His promises, believing in His protection, believing in that He will sustain us and bless us, that we will uh, continue to live in a way that pleases Him, a lifestyle that is a life wholly committed to Him in uh, right moral behavior. So He says then, I will confirm My covenant in chapter 17 between Me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. So we come back to the same issue, which is the major issue, the major tension, and that is uh, birthing children. Now, uh, I might say by uh, the change in the names that will occur here for both Abraham and uh, Sarai to Sarah, that the change of a name is a way in which to signal a new identity. And so uh, let's look then 
at the language that's used for Abram and Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Uh, A-B means father and Ram means exalted, exalted father. He's going to change his name to Abraham and he explains that name. I have made you. In other words, this is a promise that from the perspective of God is as good as done. I have made you. So this is a declaration with ongoing consequences, a father of many nations. Raham, of meaning father. Raham meaning many, father of many. And so we have then in his name, Abraham, embedded uh, the idea of many nations, which would of course remind us of how Abraham and his offspring are the response of God to the Tower of Babel, where many nations were formed, but not because of their faithfulness. They wanted to make a name for themselves out of pride and reputation. But rather, Abraham humbly submits to God's promises who tells Abraham in chapter 12, I will make your name great. So Abraham does not seize for himself a name illicitly, but rather God blesses him with giving him a name, reputation. And continuing, he says in explanation, I will make you very fruitful. Now, doesn't that remind you of what we've read before? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And then what we have discovered, the language of fruitfulness. And then he goes on to say, I will make nations of you. Now, this is an additional aspect in verse 6, and kings will come from you. And that is certainly the case. As you read the story of Genesis, Ishmael's tribal kings, Esau's Edomite kings, and then from Isaac and Jacob and the twelve sons out of Judah will come the great kings of the Davidic dynasty. So kings will come from you. This all having to do with God's intervention, God's work. The I wills are so prominent here. And notice that the covenant will be for everlasting, forever between me and you and your descendants for all the generations to come. Now, the only way that this is possible is going to be through an offspring who is that uh, anticipated deliverer who can secure for Abraham and his descendants this uh, permanent relationship to be your God and the God of your descendants after you, and that it might be everlasting the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, a sojourner, a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. This reminds you of chapter 15. Remember in the opening verses, we spoke of how there's a promise of descendants like the stars of the sky, and then there is the ceremony of um, the covenant with the splitting in half of the, the animals that are taken for sacrifice. And in that context, a discussion 
of how God will give Abraham the land of Canaan after his descendants have spent 400 years, four decades in Egypt. Then they will be delivered. They'll return to the land of Canaan and there that land will be a part of Abraham's inheritance. That's what we find here also in chapter 17, reference to the progeny of Abraham and then the land that has been promised. All set here within the uh, idea of a commitment on the part of God to Abraham and in turn Abraham's relationship to God. This is what covenant is. We've spoken of it. I want to bring it to your attention again. The importance of covenant as relationship. Now, the sign of the relationship will be circumcision. And it's an appropriate uh, sign for this relationship between God and Abraham and his progeny because it's made in the male uh, organ, sex organ, that produces offspring. And so this is part of the sign of commitment on the part of Abraham that he has received in all of his descendants this great promise of a blessing. Now, circumcision was not unique to Israel. Their neighbors practiced circumcision. But in this case, it has to do not with a puberty rite, but rather, or any hygienic purpose, but rather it um, signals the promise, even a mark in the body. Sarah's name is also changed to Sarah. And from her, similarly, she will be uh, the mother of nations and kings will come from her. Sarah means princess. And uh, again, Sarah also means princess. Well, what was Abraham's response? Not a heroic response. He laughs because um, at his age, 99 years, and if she becomes pregnant, he says, can a man 100 years old uh, be the father of a child? And then he exclaims, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. And God promises him, as we find in verse 20, I will take care of Ishmael. This son whom you uh, love, I'll take care of him. And he too will increase because of you, Abraham, because of my covenant with you. And he will become uh, the father of 12 rulers, just as we will see Isaac becomes the father of 12 rulers. So God specifies in verse 21 that uh, the name of the child will be Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. So the identity of the son in verse 19 is said to be Isaac. And Isaac is going to his name play on the response of Abraham. And as we'll see in chapter 18 next time, the response of Sarah, who also laughs at overhearing that this will be the case, she will give birth. Isaac means he laughs or he will laugh. So on the one hand, the name Isaac reflects the uh, doubt and hesitancy of uh, his parents, Abraham and Sarah. But on the other hand, it uh, speaks to the great joy that the child will bring to this aging family.
So we are told that Abraham took his son Ishmael and circumcised him and everybody else in his household. And uh, it says in verse 24 that he was circumcised. The chapter concludes by saying that everybody who lived in the household, in other words, under the umbrella of the covenant, experienced circumcision. So Ishmael also is blessed. He's an outsider. And this brings us to the appropriate setting for understanding Sodom and Gomorrah. And next time, we will move on to Lesson 13, chapters 18 and 19, regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Dr. Kenneth Matthews and his teaching on the book of Genesis. This is session number 13, The Covenant Ceremony and the Covenant Sign, Part 2, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 through chapter 17, verse 27. Mm-hmm.